Good afternoon to everyone joining us today. Good afternoon to everyone joining us today. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for joining our webinar, which is hosted by the SDG Philanthropy Platform. Today, um, the topic of our webinar is mainstreaming SDGs in national development plans, and we'll be hearing um, experience and lessons from Zambia. Just a quick note to everyone listening today that the webinar is being recorded, and after the presentations, there will be an opportunity for the audience members to ask uh, questions to the panelists, and this can be done through the chat or um, questions section. Um, before I hand over to the panelists to start their presentations, I'll just give a brief overview of the topic. So Zambia has recently developed its seventh national development plan, which will run from 2017 to 2021. And it's held under the theme of accelerating development efforts towards Vision 2030 without leaving anyone behind. Is to create a diversified, resilient economy for sustained growth and socio-economic transformation driven by, amongst other things, agriculture. So there are five interrelated, mutually enforcing um, strategic development areas, which will be alluded to in the presentation. Among other things, the Zambian government has used the plan to domesticate several of its international development commitments, including the UN's Agenda 23 on Sustainable Development, and the African Union's Agenda 2063. So recognizing the interrelatedness of the development priorities under the SDGs, the AU Agenda 2063, and indeed the seventh national development plan, the government has moved from a sectoral-based approach to development planning to a multi-sectoral one. So this um, presentation will be an opportunity for others to hear about Zambia's process in developing the plan, their experience, and lessons learned. So I'm going to do, um, we'll introduce the speakers. I have Mr. Richard, the Assistant Director of the Department of Planning from Ministry of National Development Planning, and Ms. Bimbanashe Mukota, who is the Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist in the UN Resident Coordinator Nature's office in Zambia. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Richard speaking. I think I've been introduced by the hostess here. Uh, my task today is just to give a brief, mainly I'll focus on volume on uh, uh, planning is not a new phenomenon to Zambia. We started this uh, uh, when Zambia was born, and since 1964, we've had about uh, six plans, and uh, and to achieve these plans have been the seventh nation, the third one in the series. And I wish to share. That the this plan, the one, is a strategic policy document. Mainly for when we move to government, we have the government. I may wish to know that the plan is underpinned by the decentralization. Concepts as well as the main the agendas that uh, the country has signed. The hostess also sent. Then also 
the theory of change. And there was an issues paper which was produced just to issues that Zambia was facing the plan. So the, the plan I'm mentioning now is uh, based on on an integrated uh, multi sector approach as opposed to the best standard that I mentioned. Now, to just straight, I'll just point out uh, items that this is used and the one that we are implementing now. Uh, maybe we had a sort of a style approach where each sector was planning in uh, isolation. More or less from the other sectors. This led to poor coordination and there was lack of value for money because there was a lot of duplication in some cases. And the lack of coordination meant to for. But the new integration, we are targeting a key vision of to be more well, we've also restructured our coordination bodies, meaning we'll see a situation whereby there's better coordination in terms of what we want to achieve. I think I can move on to the plan itself. Um, as alluded to earlier, the plan has five key development areas. These are economic diversification and job creation. And uh, these we foresee it being driven by agriculture, tourism, and mining, amongst others. These are the plans. Then we have a second pillar on poverty and vulnerability reduction. And then we have reducing developmental inequalities. Human development. Uh, the last one, in terms of the five pillars, is creating a conducive governance environment for a diversified uh, economy. But and takes cognizance of uh, cross issues such as climate change, disaster risk reduction, gender inequality, and HIV AIDS. Then the the two. Okay. Then, then the, to achieve those outcomes, we have the below pillar. Then below that, we move on to the, the, from the program goal. That's why we start looking at the implementation plan or the volume two. So uh, as, we, as I have said, The integration amongst these various pillars is key to achieving what the plan intends to do. So we see a situation where all the so that they are self-reinforcing and mutually reinforcing. For example, we have a context of the different pillars. We will see that Diversification contributes to reduction of uh, poverty in terms of creating this to identify. This is uh, under uh, sectors like agriculture and tourism being the The drivers. We have now the other uh, strategies like on transport and infrastructure, ICB. That we we see to reinforce. and attend through this plan. Again, uh, another illustration is when we look at the European Town, we need to worry on the management. The 
other other sectors like energy will come in. So issues of um, uh, well, when you build infrastructure, you need you, you need the access to energy. We need access to energy. also provide not just uh, water for drinking or water for construction, but it will be also water for entertainment for the tour, tourists. So you have to manage the water to reinforce them. Then you also need to come to the issue to be access to the issue. Here I want to emphasize that government has seen the issue, the issue of not just integrating activities, but also sequencing of programs. For example, when you're doing a farm block, we've had the, the experience whereby certain activities haven't been done in proper sequence, we're resulting in misuse of, rather misapplication of resources, and in some cases, uh, mismatch of activities leading to poor results. For example, if you are, we are going to develop a farm, we have to ask ourselves, which one do we start first? Which activities do we do at the same time? Which activities are we going to find first? So that we will see a situation whereby if it's a new farm, we'll probably say the, the lands people move in first, probably to demarcate and define the move in. So these are some of the things we are looking at, and that we also have to it across the outgoing. We need to know at which point it comes in, so that we, our resources are planned at. Yeah. Now to actualize the plan, we've uh, revised some of the coordination structures, and we've. Revise them in, in, as you can see, the screen there. At the time, five uh, bills uh, or cluster advisors are headed by permanent secretaries. And the advisors within them have technical working groups which are headed by directors. But that, that is not the only uh, working group that we have. At the Apex, we have what we call National Development Coordinating Committee. This is the Apex Board that advises development issues. It's made up mainly by the Secretary of Cabinet and the Permanent Secretaries. Then, as I said, our, our plan is also anchored on centralization. How it works is from the cluster, more or less the level of ministerial, uh, provincial development coordinating committees. And below that, we have, and we also envisage to have world development committees, which are the lowest. So, in that sense, we we'll bring in uh, particular. Then we should know that uh, levels are made up of uh, a from the government, but a state was civil society, private sector, and uh, develop other development partners. And also, uh, the opponent of uh, M and E. We also follow the same activity in the monitoring of projects is also done at various levels. So after the seven NDP, just giving a few highlights that we are discussing on the role of philanthropy in the seven NDP. I think I wish to share with you to say that that we have say linked or aligned to this. And so philanthropy will have a chance. To, to have its say and to make sure that its actions are implemented through the SDG philanthropy platform with the, the, the current focus, the thematic focus rather being on the well-being of children. I think in the in the, uh, the the pillar for enhancing human development, I think this links very well 
in the role of philanthropy, of education, being of our children. Opportunities on reducing poverty and vulnerability, or even also impact on our the, the well being. Tackling all these, the, the role of philanthropy is uh, we find a niche in all these. So they can reinforce development strategic areas are linked. And then, uh, I might also point out that the intersectoral results based 7 NDP provides an opportunity for foundations and other organizations that are to place the strong in addressing these concerns in there will be done at the level of implementation plan but it's given as a valued area then to the SDG people are linked to the country I think at this point I want to my colleague to continue the presentation Okay, um, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. In the world. Uh, my name is Vimbai Nashum Kota, and I'm the MND Senator's Office for UNZ. Um, and mainly, our role was of SDGs and also the Agenda 2063. Um, this, this was upon the request by the GAF for, for us as the UN to support them in moving from the So they did consult us in terms of their inputs into the volume listed. But when it came to volume two, they opened it up to, to us, the UN and even other stakeholders, for us to come in and support the development of this volume two. So that is where our role came into play. Um, uh, the first role that uh, we provided was really a normative role, uh, which is uh, one of our roles as the UN. And this was to provide uh, uh, technical and expert guidance in um, articulating what, can, what are the key interventions or what are the building blocks uh, for the achievement of the Seven National Development Plan. And uh, to do this, we, we looked at, uh, we compiled a resource base of policies, guidelines, and standards which are aligned to the SDGs, to the Sendai framework, and to other international commitments that Zambia has, uh, has ratified or signed. Uh, we also looked into issues of how do we align um, the Seven National Development Plan to the core programming principles, which uh, which have the overarching principle of leaving no one behind, and um, the the other principles of human rights, gender equality, and women's empowerment, sustainability and resilience, and accountability. And uh, in terms of accountability, this is where we provided evidence to 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 support uh, the government and the key stakeholders with developing Volume Two. Uh, uh, in terms of data, so that they they are able to target or able to to really reprogram the seven national development plan accordingly. Um, so there was a sub-national analysis document that was also produced um, with the UN and together with government, and a rapid integrated assessment, which is a gap analysis of uh, the volume one to see to what extent the SDGs have been covered in volume one, so that if there are any gaps, they can be addressed in, in volume two. Uh, there was also a rapid country profile, which uh, the UN led together with government, to, uh, which, provides, um, which provided the status in terms of social and economic indicators. That also gave a baseline of where the country is and where it should go. Um, the second uh, key role was on the capacity development, where um, as uh, the UN, we looked into uh, how the, the, the Seven National Member Plan Volume 2 design is aligned to the theory of change approach. And uh, already the government uh, adopted the logical framework approach, so we reinforced that with the results-based management, the theory of change, and provided support in terms of the technical expertise. 
Um, in addition, we used also our convening role as the UN to strengthen the capacity for integrated planning. And this was to, to bring in, uh, to ensure that all the key players are involved in the development of volume two. As you know, the volume two is the implementation plan. So this is the how uh, we're going to implement the volume one. What are the building blocks and what is it that we need to really do for us to be able to achieve the results? And um, it, we, we followed again that logical framework and results-based approach. So in, in short, I looked at the key deliverables by the UN as follows, is five of them. The first one was really to come up with a methodology for the development of volume two. Is this was actually the second uh, attempt of the government of uh, Republic of Zambia to come up with an implementation plan. In the past, uh, initial development plans, they would only have one document, which was the volume one. So this uh, volume two, it was, uh, it was uh, a second attempt. And also, it is in the era of the Agenda 2030. So it's the first time that is being done in this, in this SDG era. So we had to come up with a nine-step methodolo methodology of how we move from volume one to volume two. What are the key issues that we really need to look at? And uh, there was also need for a template for the volume two, as there was no template uh, before. So a template of how it would look like, this was also another deliverable by the UN. Thirdly, which was really very key, is the rapid integrated assessment, which were, is the gap, gap analysis of volume one. This exercise is quite an intense exercise, which we did together, the UN and the government. And we spent about two weeks working day in and out, assessing the volume one by all the, the 20 development outcomes that are in the volume one. And then we're checking against the 169 targets of, um, of the SDGs to see where, how we are aligned with, with each of these. And uh, for Zambia, we didn't look at all the 17 goals. We focused on 14 goals, leaving out the ones which are not so relevant to us, like life underwater, and also the means of implementation, SDG 17, we did not look into that. So we pretty much looked at most of them. And uh, I'll go into detail on that later in the next slides. Uh, the rapid country profile, I've already talked about it. It's just a rapid review of uh, relevant national literature and data on all the domains of sustainable development. As a reference document, is we did the targeting for the 2017-2021 plan. The other key deliverable by the UN was the development of tools and guidance to help uh, this, the technical working groups and the cluster advisory groups as they developed the contents of volume two. And with these tools and guidance, we focused on these four areas, climate change and DRR mainstreaming. There were some tools that were developed to ensure that um, climate change is well mainstreamed across the five pillars that have been mentioned earlier. The second one was on leaving no one behind principle. We had to come up with a checklist also to ensure that we've managed to really address this principle across the five pillars. This also included the gender mainstreaming. The interesting one was also the horizontal policy coherence proofing, because now we have to look at how, how aligned are we uh, across the five pillars. Is, as, you already, as, as my colleague has already mentioned from the government, that the plan is really interlinked. There are interlinkages across the pillars. So it was important that there is a horizontal policy coherence, as well as the vertical in terms of going down to the district, which is the next step that we are going to support the government with moving on. So in terms of this rapid integrated assessment, this is a tool that is in the UNDG uh, maps, the mainstreaming acceleration policy support document uh, that has been produced by the UNDG. And um, we, we made reference to this document and we were able to undertake the exercise. From the 100 SDG targets um, uh, across the 14 SDGs that I talked about, we saw that the volume one, 52% of the SDG targets are fully aligned to the seven national development plan. 33% were not aligned and 15% were partially aligned. This didn't look so bad because the key, where, where you find where it's not aligned, it was more on the indicators. We realized that they were not, um, the indicators were not well articulated to really measure progress 
against the SDG targets that were linked to the pillars in the volume one. And this was something that could easily be addressed in the volume two. So the, in terms of the gaps, uh, if, before I go to the gaps, if I show you in terms of uh, the order of prioritization of the plan itself, according to the rapid integrated assessment that we undertook, you realize that the seven national development plan focuses quite highly on SDG one, which is poverty, and SDG two on hunger, followed by SDG ten, reduced inequality, and then infrastructure and development. We we did realize that so climate change, you see, it's uh, at the bottom there, the third bottom. Um, the issues of gender, gender comes out at number five, and uh, it was not. It was yes, we do have um, a pillar. Which has, um, which has reduced uh, developmental inequalities, which is a strategy actually, dedicated strategy on gender, inequality, gender inequality issues. But uh, what was missing was the mainstreaming across the other four pillars, which, which was not very clear in the, which is not very clear in volume one. Same with climate change. Climate change, you could see it's, it's been tackled here and there, but it was not well mainstreamed. So these were the kind of gaps that we noticed in volume one and needed to be addressed in volume two, which is the implementation plan. So the key gaps, as I already highlighted, was the mainstreaming climate change res resilience, mainstreaming of gender, particularly issues of gender-based violence were not coming out so clearly in volume one, child abuse issues, early child marriage, uh, which are really uh, hot topics in Zambia at the moment. The issues of addressing migration and mobility was also uh, touched on a bit in volume one, but not so clearly. And we already do realize that uh, Zambia is, is been receiving a lot of a, an influx of refugees from DRC this year. So this, this it's, it's a country which is bordered by um, eight countries. So the, the chances of migration and mobility are really high. So it was really a key area that you thought needed to be addressed. Water and sanitation was also uh, not very clear yet. We do realize that in Zambia, the sanitation issue, uh, sanitation and water are uh, really some uh, gray areas that need to be addressed. And the um, data availability and disaggregation, insufficient indicators to monitor the initial development plan. This was also one of the other major area. So based uh, on, on this uh, analysis, of um, the rapid integrated assessment, we're able to now to come up with a, a very informed methodology that would address these gaps uh, and ensure that we have a very strong volume two that speaks to volume one, but also is well mainstream to the SDGs. In this document, we're actually in the process of finalizing, and it's 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 a it's an um, Inter integrated approach that we've taken, as my colleague has said, from the silo approach of the sectors. When you look at volume one and volume two, you cannot really pick the sectors, but you find that uh, each of the programs, they are so much interlinked and they're different players uh, from the different sectors that are contributing to that. Uh, so this is, which is really uh, the, the way the approach that the Agenda 2030 is of being interlinked and interrelated. So uh, we're really quite pleased and we've heard that uh, for Zambia, uh, this is the first, uh, one of the first countries that has developed a seven national, uh, that's it's developed a national development plan in the uh, SDG era. So it's really a, a good attempt and very uh, brave move by the government of Zambia. So in terms of success factors and lessons learned, um, the number one was really the, that this was the first and bold attempt of the government of Zambia in planning using the integrated approach. It is not an easy thing to do, moving away from your comfort zone, and uh, even for the for the um, for the sectors themselves, it 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 requires a lot of mindset uh, change, uh, not to feel that the the something that has been taken away from them, but to still feel feel that they're in charge of the deliver of the seventh plan even though now they are working together with others. So it's really a brave move. It's a courageous move that the government has taken and uh, once implemented will really reap good fruits. The second one is that uh, is the RRBM or the results-based management approach that drove the need for integrated thinking and planning because the focus now was on what is it that you want to achieve or what are, what are the needs of the country. It drove away people from thinking 
in their in their in the silo approach or in their comfort zones. So already during the development of volume two, you could see the integrated thinking. Uh, you could have somebody um, talk always in the Minister of Energy saying, you know what, I need to, to talk to the Minister of Infrastructure so that we see how do we link together in this pro project. So already you, you, the, the, the integrated thinking started in the development because of the res results-based management approach that was taken on board. Uh, the third one is the increased knowledge of how to identify portion and articulate results. This uh, took uh, quite some time for people to get to this position because we are so much used to activity uh, planning. So moving to a results-based planning, there's, there was some training that had to be done and not just one training but iterative training sessions uh, to ensure that everybody has an understanding of the results-based uh, management language. It was also quite highly engaging, interactive, and an intense process, uh, I must say, and it took uh, a bit of time. Um, we then had to have a dedicated two weeks to lock up uh, uh, people from all the clusters that is re with representation from the sectors to work on finalizing the first good draft of the volume two, which and people went right into the night and they were quite engaged, which was really good. Um, so what we're seeing now with the volume two is that we've moved away from uh, activity-based budgeting to results-based budgeting, uh, so the, which is really linked to the seven national development plan. Uh, in the past, you would see that you have a national development plan, but the budgeting uh, is done almost in parallel. So you don't see the link between what it is that the government has planned for the five years and how the budgeting is going. But with this uh, new new plan, we have already seen the shift into results-based uh, budgeting, and also even uh, the way the government is doing the quarterly progress reports to the to the president. Um, it's no longer by sectors, but it's actually by those five clusters. So you have all the ministers who, who are responsible for each of the cluster reporting together to the president on the progress and the challenges that they're facing towards implementation of their programs. Um, another uh, success factor is the consistent and sustained policy implementation in that the, the, the implementation of the fiscal decentralization devolution. These are really the key enablers for the success of an integrated approach of this manner. And the issue of statistical data availability, it has now become the talk uh, and like before, unlike before that, we really need to have data for us to be able to program and for us to be able to see progress in what we're doing and the reforms that are going on already in the country. The eighth one, the success factor, is that you cannot have a plan on itself and not really look at your coordination mechanisms. So they also uh, uh, change the approach of how they're coordinating as the, as, as the government. So they moved away from the sectoral uh, sectoral approach also to the integrated approaches, the class advisory groups, which my colleague has already alluded to. And the last one, I think with everything that we are doing, if the, in any kind of change, you need to have an effective communication strategy for it to be a success, especially of this magnitude. So there's also a communication strategy that the government has also uh, is also currently working on and trying to ensure that every person understands the seventh plan. I'll talk into detail on the communications later. So, uh, um, which is now here. Mm -hmm. So the first <laughs> uh, now uh, at the moment, the new one, the first, it is the first company is on, is on the communications. And for any mindset shift, it takes time. And you, you really need to plan how you, you ensure that you reach out to all the key stakeholders beyond the government, beyond the UN, to the communities, to the people on the streets, so that they know what the government is, is working towards and how can they hold the government accountable uh, for, for, their, for their human rights. So the communication strategy, which is in draft at the moment, but already work is going on, it really comprises of sensitizing uh, the government officials and stakeholders on the seven plan together with the SDGs. So we were not leaving out the SDGs because we know our plan is already aligned to the SDGs. Public awareness campaigning, 
um, strategic messages and working with different uh, institutions so that everybody understands radio programs, TV programs, all that is already underway and going on to really get everybody on board. The Ministry of our National Planning was in the field in the past two weeks, going out to all the provinces to disseminate this uh, seven national development plan so that everybody knows what it is that we're talking about. Second uh, part is the coordination. In terms of the SDGs, uh, I'm happy to say the government has uh, uh, introduced a committee uh, within each of the clusters, a subcommittee on SDGs, which is responsible for SDGs implementation and financing. So this is really a good move that we're already integrating within the national coordination structures. How can we ensure that the SDGs are taken on board across the ministries, across uh, all the key stakeholders? Um, the other section is on financing of the SDGs. This is really key. And uh, a plan of this kind, uh, of the same plan, is quite, uh, as I said, very courageous and uh, quite um, ambitious, just like the SDGs are. So the issue of sustainable financing is key. And uh, uh, the, the, the ministry and the government is looking into the non-traditional uh, financing sources so that uh, you know we, we're not just looking at the usual traditional donors, because now we require more, as, as this is a needs-based uh, plan. And then in terms of monitoring reporting of the SDGs, this national development plan is has got specific and like smart targets that have been put in there, which is good, and year-on-year -year targets. So the monitoring even of the SDGs will be together with the monitoring of the seventh plan. So we're not going to have a separate SDG report, but it will be the same report that is produced annually by the seventh plan will incorporate also the progress in terms of the SDGs. The, the National Statistical Office is also going through some restructuring. They, they've just adopted the National Statistic Development Strategy, uh, yes, uh, so which is, which is really a good move to ensure that it's really well resourced to be able to deliver on uh, the statistics that the country needs. Um, there's also a National Sustainable Development Indicator Framework and Information System that is also underway and being developed together with the Central Statistical Office and the m and &E personnel in the government. So a lot of work is going on, uh, going on at the moment. It's not an easy task, but uh, it's, 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 it's quite good that the government has realized the need to have all this that I've mentioned on this SDG coordination and implementation framework for the success of the SDGs in Zambia. So what have been the challenges? Obviously, we've had quite some challenges. It's, and I think I've said it has not been easy a number of times already in my presentation. And uh, these are reasons why I've been saying it's not easy. Um, number one is embracing the complexity of the leave no one behind principle and moving away from sectoral to multi-sectoral integrated is re was really a challenge or is still a constraint. I don't sure I like to use challenge, maybe a constraint. Really, because it's it's uh, when you're looking at leave no one behind, it means you are you, you require a lot of data for you to even know who is left behind. And then, as we all know, uh, for developing countries, we have quite uh, some challenges in terms of data. So just embracing this principle is really uh, be, it's not been easy. The SDGs are very ambitious, and uh, yes, we have tried very much for this seven plan to address as much as we can, but not all. But as we know, it's a five-year plan, and we're going to have two more national development plans. So we, we've put that really, we've not, we, we know that we're working towards the next 15 years. So whatever it is that we might not have covered in this plan will be covered in the coming years. But you know, there's always a tendency, uh, it's difficult to say, um, let's not look at this SDG target and prioritize on this one. It was not an easy thing to do to kind of like choose or prioritize the SDGs, but had to be done. The limited understanding of SDGs across the key stakeholders, the SDGs have just come into play and not so many people are familiar. We cannot sing them yet, like we did the MDGs. So it's this. it took quite some time to get people to understand the SDGs and to get them on board. The results-based approach, I think I did mention that already. 
the limited understanding and getting people to move from activity-based to results-based also took a, a bit of the time. In the change of mindset, I think this is key. The whole of government approach, breaking down silos, uh, the, the government is still working on that. It's going to take some time to really get to the whole of government approach, but uh, we should get there. It's the exercise of uh, mainstreaming the SDG since the seventh plan was really capital intensive and very time consuming. It took a lot of time. I mean, to already to, to, to get to where we are now, it took quite some time and it was very capital intensive. Um, the limited capacity of key staff for leading and coordinating the planning processes. And it was mainly because they have their, as the Minister of Development Planning, they also have other duties daily or core duties that they have to take care of every day. But at the same time, there was this huge plan they were looking at and they had to develop. So it was not uh, very easy. And we had to co-opt uh, to, to, to help as the UN to get some facilitators to help them to move the process uh, forward. Yeah. So lastly, going forward, uh, uh, just adding on to what my colleague said on the role of philanthropy, I think the key message here is that uh, for Zambia, the state and national development plan is really, really the entry point for all key stakeholders to support SDG mainstreaming and national development. So, and as you already have seen, really the seventh plan is trying to take care of probably 80 to 90 percent of the 2030 agenda. So it's in a good place. Everybody can fit in and can, is able to support or find their place in the Seven Nations Open Plan. And uh, I think what is key moving forward, uh, the next steps is really the strategic communications and dissemination of the SDGs and the Seventh Plan. This is quite uh, some uh, uh, time intensive and uh, also capital intensive exercise. And there's, there will really be a need for the role of the philanthropy to support in terms of ensuring that everybody understands the SDGs and are able to hold the government accountable. The financing of the seventh plan directly or indirectly is also key. As I already said, we need to move away from the usual traditional donors to support this uh, task that we have at hand. Uh, the strengthening of the system of disaggregated data collection analysis is also key, and also the monitoring and reporting so that we don't just end by saying, oh, we, we have a very good plan in our shelf, but how are we monitoring and how are we reporting to show that we're able to reach uh, the, the results that we've put in that plan. So I think uh, this should be all from our side. And thank you to, for, for your listening. And we take you back to our hostess here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to both our uh, presenters for a really engaging and interesting um, presentation, highlighting Zambia's pioneering approach in um, mainstreaming the SDGs and its development plan. I would now like to open the floor to the audience for any questions you may have for either of um, the panelists. So feel free to raise your hand or um, you can also type your question in the chat or question section. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Hello. Hi there. This is Maribel. So I have a question for the panelists. Um, I was wondering what is great. What is the ministry? Thank you so much for this great webinar. I was wondering how how the Ministry of National Development Planning is planning um, to engage young people and children in this process and how they can be active um, stakeholders in decision-making processes. This is something that the UN has put a lot of, um, ha has highlighted a lot. So I'm wondering what you'll be doing from Zambia. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Maribel. Um, 
Yes. Um, thanks, Maribel, for your question. Yes, um, this is one area I missed, you know, Zambia being a, such a youthful population, definitely the young people have a part to play in the planning and development. Um, so I think, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, our role was really a convening role to ensure that all key stakeholders are involved in the planning process itself. Um, this was done for the development of Volume 2. And uh, from our side uh, as the UN, we, we have formed a platform, which is called the UN Youth Partnership Platform, uh, with representation from the, all the 10 provinces in the country. Um, and ages 15 to 35. So we have this platform where the young people um, are able to engage, we're able to engage with the government or to review even the volume one, give their suggestions and the development of volume two. The reason being that um, we do have a, a number of youth uh, groups in the, in the country, but uh, they're facing challenges really in, uh, in um, the coordination of the youth platforms. So that is why the, the UN had to come up with, to step in and come up with this platform. Uh, and also this platform, actually its role is also to, not, to work very closely with the Ministry of Youth to strengthen the national coordination structures, which at the moment are not working very well. So we, we, we have engaged in terms of young people 15 to 35 in terms of uh, the, the, the development of volume two. As we speak right now, they're in the process of going into the district. This, uh, the UNYPP, which I talked about, they're going into the provinces uh, from next week uh, to engage with the young people on the SDGs and the seventh plan in the provinces. So, and we're working together with the National Women Planning and also the Minister of Youth in that exercise. And uh, so, so there are quite a lot of uh, ways that uh, I think the, the ministry is trying to ensure that there's engagement of all the key stakeholders uh, across the different ages and uh, uh, across the country. My colleague has something to add also. Uh, th thank you so much for that question. Actually, in our issues paper, one of the key issues that came out was the issue of uh, unemployment and specifically youth unemployment. Uh, generally, unemployment amongst the youth is very, very high. Uh, you'll be talking in the range of 70% plus. But one of the things through our uh, development plan that we've realized is uh, within it we've developed what we are calling quick win projects basically to create jobs for the targeting the youth. I can cite an example of uh, each province now, we've got 10 provinces in the country, each province has been requested and I think they've submitted uh, 50, 50, to procure 50,000 hectares of pine plantations yeah, for, for pine plantations targeting to employ youths. So a number of youth organizations have approached our office so that they can take part in the implementation of 7NDP and we are engaging them. Some have come through the, the UN system, others have come through the office of the Secretary to Cabinet and we are very happy to work with them. Mm -hmm. And then also government has what we call Youth Empowerment Fund through which it encourages the youth to get uh, into business and engage in uh, private business. Mm -hmm. I think I'll Thank you. I see that we have a question from Kritikos and Shindano. Um, I will just unmute you so that you can ask your question. Please go ahead, Kritikos. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it's, it's quite strange to be asking questions when you've been involved in the process quite a lot. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we've done quite a good job in developing the 7 NDP, but I'm looking at an area I think which also the SDG philanthropy could also look at and maybe more uh, towards the UN system as a whole in terms of the gaps and this is specifically with the existing uh, data gaps. Uh, one of the things that you see with volume two uh, is the issue to do with the baselines. Um, the data that is informing the volume two is basically existing data. Uh, and no robust fresh data has been collected uh, and I think this is critical for both uh, indicator development that are linked to the SDG but also the monitoring process especially that the frequency will be quite uh, quite high given that it will be on an annual basis in terms of monitoring 
And I think it's a critical area to be able to determine the success uh, uh, of the seventh NDP. Um, and, and I think another area of challenge is basically the period within which the seven NDP is running, uh, which is uh, during a physical constraint position as a country. Uh, and I think for us to really succeed in SDG implementation at the seventh in NDP as a whole, we need to try and pull in as much resources as possible as a country. And I think this is where now key strategic partnerships become critical, such as the SDG mm -hmm. philanthropy. Thank you. Mm. We could not agree with you more, uh, Kritekas. Thank you very much for that. And uh, indeed, these are these are critical areas, especially on the issues of data and the issues of uh, of financing. And um, we, we are we're hopeful that with with once the bill is passed, I think it's it's been put on the planning and uh, budgeting bill. Once it's passed in Parliament, it will be a good uh, um, uh, platform for us to really take forward the issues of data and strengthening the central statistical uh, system, also even other stakeholders here. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we have time just for one or two more questions mm -hmm. in case anyone has any. Yes, Kerry, if I may ask a question. Sure, please go ahead, Natalia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Natalia speaking from Istanbul. I would like to thank the panelists for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I enjoyed a lot, especially at the, in the depths of the process that you have taken it so seriously, and you have considered so many important things uh, in, your, in your National Development Plan implementation. So, um, as, as you already stated many times, it's, um, uh, we should move away from working in silence and we should extend the cooperation and partnership to other stakeholders. So my question is whether you have any specific plans in mind or in vision how you would like to engage other important stakeholders such as private sector, such as uh, foundations, philanthropists, social investors and um, civil society organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much for that observation and question. Uh, I can't agree with you more that uh, to achieve this, I think we maybe we didn't go further to explain the membership of uh, some of the past advisory groups. Um, one of the participants, Mr. Shindano, he is from the civil society. He's a member, a key member of one of the clusters, and not just the civil society, also pri the private sector has participated in some of the deliberations of the cluster advisory groups. This is in the form of uh, business associations, mm -hmm. in the form of uh, even business entities. And we go further, even faith-based organizations and the academia are also involved. Mm -hmm. And even uh, what we call traditional leadership, they are also involved at different levels. So we appreciate the fact that this is a, a national document. And also the concept of decentralization means you have to engage as many people as possible at all levels. So I, I hope that uh, sort of clarifies the issue. Thank you. Okay, um, we have time for one more question. And uh, if no one has any questions, we can end there. Okay, it appears that there are no more questions. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, it has been recorded and uh, a link will be sent out in the next couple of days in case you'd like to revisit the presentations or anything. So thank you very much for tuning in today and thank you very much to both of our panelists. Um, wish you all a good rest of the day. Thank you.